So we began this series by understanding that the way that you look at the book of Revelation is not the way that a lot of people look at it. A lot of people look at it as a very scary book. Some people are like, oh man, I hope I don't ever go through any of that. Some people are like, how could this possibly be a comfort to any Christian? The Bible does say that those that read it, those that hear it read, they're going to be blessed. And you're like, wow, man, how can you be blessed by reading about dragons and beasts that come up out of the earth and they've got scorpion stings and they're going to torture us? How can you uh, be comforted when you read about uh, famine and war and the four horses of the apocalypse, all right? Well, that's because you look at it through the wrong lens. And we discovered the key to understanding the book of Revelation is to look at it through the lens of Jesus Christ. It is all about Jesus. He is the one that wins. He is the one that is to be worshiped. He is the one that puts everything back to order. And so um, in this series, we've been looking at that. And today, we're going to wrap the series up and we're going to talk about heaven. Let's talk about heaven. Now, my goal is to give you a simple and understandable and biblical picture of what heaven is. Not what some person says, but what does the Bible actually say? Now, I can't spend uh, hours and hours on this topic, though I could. So I'm going to try to give you just a very brief overview today. What does the Bible say that heaven is like? There's a lot of misunderstanding about heaven. Some people believe that you go to heaven because you're good. In fact, most people in America, according to surveys that I've read, they would answer the question, how do you go to heaven when you die? Most people say by keeping the Ten Commandments or by being a good person. That's what they say. And we know that the Bible says that's impossible because you can't possibly be good enough. In fact, if you're going to go to heaven because of being good, you've got to be perfect. You can't even sin once. You can't have a bad thought once. You can't come up short once, not even once. And that is an impossible standard. It's the standard of perfection. And we, we know that we cannot do that. And so that's not the way you go to heaven when you die. Uh, some people believe that when we go to heaven, we're going to be angels. Well, that's not true either. I know a lot of people think, well, you know, my loved one died, my uh, nephew died, my niece died, and uh, she's going to be, heaven got a new angel today. And I, I don't mock people when they're in pain, but I want you to understand that you're not going to be an angel in heaven. You're not going to sprout wings. In fact, there are few examples of angels having wings in the Bible anyway. And the ones that do have wings are called seraphim or cherubim, okay? And it's not the normal angels. If you read about angels, and angels are real, but if you read about angels in the Bible, normally they are on mission for God. They are ministers for God. They are sent for a purpose. The Bible does describe that we have angels that guard us and protect us and angels that are serving as ministers for uh, God's purpose in this earth, okay? Uh, if you read about angels in the Bible, most of the time, they're pretty tough dudes. It's not, they're, they're not flying around with a harp or a bow and arrow and they're not flying around with wings like a little baby, look, little chubby looking baby, okay? That's not what angels are like. You read about angels in the Bible, and there were angels that literally killed over 100,000 enemies of God at one time. They're powerful, okay? You don't want to mess with an angel, all right? I know there used to be a show called Touched by an Angel. Um, I'm not sure you want to be touched by an angel if they're mad at you, okay? I'm just saying. But you're not going to be an angel when you get to heaven. You're going to be better. You're going to be better. The Bible tells us that angels are in a way very jealous. They want to look into the things that we are able to experience with the love of God, with the purpose of God, with what Jesus did for us. They, are, they don't experience that. They're ministers of God. And so when you die and you're a believer, you go to heaven, 
immediately your spirit will go to heaven, but your body will get there later after the resurrection. Because one day in eternity, you're not going to be floating around on a cloud, playing a harp. That's not what heaven is like. That, in fact, to me would not be heaven. It'd be the other place. All right. Because if I had to float around on a cloud for all of eternity, listening to harp music, count me out. Don't want to do it. All right. But when you get to heaven, your, your spirit goes the moment you die, but also after the resurrection, you're going to be reunited with a resurrected body, okay? It's not going to be a body like what we have now, and by that I mean it's not going to be under a curse of sin. It'll be a physical body. The Bible describes for us resurrected bodies. Jesus had a resurrected body. What did he do? He was able to talk. He was able to eat. He was able to touch and taste and smell. And the Bible describes that in heaven, we're going to experience the greatest wine, the greatest food, the greatest feasts. Okay. Let me just say this. As a as a person in a, in a fallen, sin-cursed body, even as a believer, there are things that we know that are not getting better, they're getting worse. Okay? You know what I'm saying? Anybody getting older? Anybody have a birthday this year? Okay? You know what I'm talking about, right? Because when you start stacking those up, then things start really weighing you down. Most of the time, it's your waist that's weighing you down. The older you get, the more things hurt. The older you get, the more you forget things. The only bad thing, or the only good thing rather about having a bad memory is you meet lots of new friends all the time, right? So, but the, the truth is in this body, it breaks down. You're gonna get sick. You're gonna get disease. It's not gonna be perfect. Even things that are normally very enjoyable for us, sometimes they're not enjoyable. Let, let me just give you an example. You ever go to your grandma's at Thanksgiving? Now, maybe some of you didn't grow up like I did, where grandma, you always had uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas at her house, and it was just a spread that was to die for. And literally, it was so good that after you finished eating, you felt like you were going to die. You know what I'm talking about? You ate so much that you had to, if you've ever eaten so much, you've had to undo your belt or your pants, you've eaten too much. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Now, the good news is this. When you get to heaven, it's not going to be like that. You're, you're going to have perfect enjoyment. You ever eat something that you taste it, and it is so good, it almost transports you to the third heaven? Anybody ever eat something like that, that good? I... I feel that way about some foods. Okay, I like banana pudding. Now, I don't like some banana pudding. I like banana pudding that my grandma used to make, that the bananas were really, really ripe, and she put the, the uh, vanilla wafers, vanilla wafers, whatever, in there, and the uh, meringue or the whipped cream on top. I mean, oh my goodness, I'm just about, uh, my mouth is watering thinking about it right now. But there's going to be a perfection in heaven. You're going to be able to eat. You're going to be able to feast without ever being too full. You're going to be able to eat the greatest food in the world without ever feeling the pain of, oh my, I shouldn't have had that third plate. It's going to be perfection, okay? So what is heaven like? Well, I heard one guy describe heaven. He said he believed that in heaven that he was going to duck hunt all day long. I don't really think that's going to be in heaven. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that that's not in the Bible. All right. I'm just going to say, um, some people, they think about heaven as, you know, some activity that they enjoy. I heard about one guy that loved baseball, just loved baseball. And he had a dream one night, had a vision, an angel appeared to him and he was so excited. He wanted to ask the angel about heaven. He said, is heaven a real place? He said, yes, it is in the dream. He said, and he was asking him all kinds of questions about heaven. He said, I got one really important question. Angel said, what's that? He said, 
Is there baseball in heaven? I've always dreamed about this. I've always loved baseball. And I think it'd be awesome if there is. Is there baseball in heaven? And the angel smiled. He looked at him. He said, well, I've got good news and bad news. He said, what's the good news? He said, yes, there is baseball in heaven. He said, that is awesome. He said, what's the bad news? He said, you're pitching tonight. All right, so. (laughs) Well, we want to give you a biblical picture of what heaven is. So we're going to read in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 6. We've got several other verses we're going to read. This is John writing. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. By the way, if you're looking for the actual definition of heaven, it's that, God with us. The abode of God, where you're going to be with God. And he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. You must understand that there is a coherent story throughout all of Scripture. I realized that it was written over a period of probably 1,500 years, 40 different authors, 66 different books, New Testament and Old Testament before Christ and after Christ. But the fact is, it's got one coherent story. And it begins with God creating a beautiful garden where he wants to communicate and commune with mankind. And it ends with a beautiful garden city coming down out of heaven where God, once again, communes with mankind. And he lives with us forever. Now, all the in-between part, there's a bloody war, and it's a violent war. It's a vicious war, but the good news is this. Jesus wins. Jesus wins, and that's what we can be thankful for today. So, what is it about heaven? Well, I just want to give you three simple thoughts, okay? First of all is this. Heaven is a real place. It's not the figment of someone's imagination. It is a real place. There is an afterlife. Once you die, you're just really beginning. You are transitioning from this realm into eternity. And so heaven is a real place. If heaven is real, then hell must also be real. And so there is a a choice that one must make. You either go to heaven and spend eternity with God, or you're separated from God in a place called hell for all of eternity. But you are an eternal soul. You are an eternal being. When God conceived you, when you were conceived in the womb, when God allowed you to be born and to breathe the breath of life, God planned eternity for you. This is a very important thing for you to think about. You're going to live somewhere forever. Now, you're not going to live in this physical body. Your body's going to die. It's going to be put back into the ground or maybe cremated. Um, And but the end is is the same. Uh, Your body ceases to exist in its current state. And it either is burned or it's put in the grave. And it eventually, as the Bible says, goes back to dust. Now, um, your eternal soul, however, will live somewhere forever. You're either going to spend eternity with God or an eternity separated from God. And so, uh, eternity is important to think about. In fact, 
there's no doubt in my mind that eternity is far more important than this life. You could say that this life is dress rehearsal for eternity because you're going to spend eternity. Now think about that. Without end, not just hundreds of years, not just thousands of years, not just millions of years, not just billions of years, but never ending. Now, if you try to make the comparison between this life and the next life, which is longer? Obviously, eternity is longer than however long you live here on this earth. Maybe you would live to be 100 years old, a centenarian. There are more and more people that are living to 100 or beyond uh, in our culture, in our society today. But even if you lived over 100 years, what is that compared to eternity? Well, here's what we know. Heaven is a real place. 2 Corinthians 12, verses uh, 1 to 4. I will reluctantly tell you about visions and revelations from the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul talking. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, Only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body, but I do know that I was called up to the, to paradise and heard things so astounding that they cannot be expressed in words, things no human is allowed to tell. In other words, he's simply saying that heaven is so wonderful, so great, he can't even describe it. He saw it and he can't, he doesn't have the words to it. He couldn't even begin to attempt how wonderful It is. Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. So I want to tell you, with the authority of Scripture today, heaven is a real place. Heaven is awaiting all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Heaven is not for the good. I know a lot of people think that that's the way you get there, but it's not. Heaven is not for the moral. Now, you should be moral. I'm not suggesting you should be immoral. But the truth is that is not how you breathe one breath of heaven's air. You don't do it by being good. You don't do it by joining the church. You don't do it by helping little old ladies cross the street. You don't do it by giving uh, homeless people on the corner 20 bucks so they can go buy food. That's not how it's done. It comes through faith alone, in Christ alone. But heaven is a very real place. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Heaven is a blessed place. It's a real place, but it's a place of, oh, so many blessings. Let me just read to you from several passages of Scripture, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, that describes what it's going to be like in heaven. Isaiah eleven six 6 through 9, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. Now, can you imagine a little child leading a lion? Can you imagine? And I don't know if you've ever been somewhere, maybe to a zoo, you saw a lion. Uh, I've been to a lot of zoos in my life, but I've also been to South Africa and I've been to Kruger National Park about 10 different times. And I got to be honest with you, there is something completely different about seeing a lion in the wild and seeing one in a cage. Um, The first time that uh, I went to South Africa, my son Brandon was with me and um, we were with uh, Bob Graham, the guy that runs our children's village there in South Africa for AIDS orphans. And he took us into Kruger National Park. And I'll never forget this. We were on safari. We're in this van. And we went up on a lion kill. They had just killed, I believe it was a kudu or something like that. Big old giant antelope. And uh, it was a whole pride of lions. And man, they were growling and snarling and eating And we pulled up next to them in this van and we were watching it. It was incredible. And Brandon, my son, he had come out of the window 
and he was videotaping over top of the van. And that way he could get a better shot. So his, his rear end was hanging out the window about this far, okay? And he's just kind of sitting out the window filming over the top of the, lamp, uh, of the, the van. Well, I guess there was a, uh, a lion that was late to the party, okay? Uh, because this lion came walking up. In fact, it wasn't walking, it was sauntering. You know what I'm talking about? You ever see that kind of person that just saunters when they walk? Like they don't have a care in the world. Like they're not really focused on what's important. Like eating is not that important to me. I'm just above it all, you know? And this lion literally walks right underneath my son. I'm talking about eight inches from his rear end. He walks under him and Brandon didn't see it. And I just gently reached out and put my hand on his shoulders. I said, do not move. (laughs) And this lion walked right underneath him and went over and joined the meal, okay? Uh, Talking about a heart-pounding experience. Now, I gotta be honest with you. When you're able to interact with a lion in the wild, that's a whole lot better than watching one through a cage, okay? A whole lot more exciting. But can you imagine how exciting it's gonna be for a lion to be able to play with a child, for a child to take that lion by the mane and just kind of like how a child does with a kitten or a puppy. They just go along and they're playing with the lion. Wouldn't it be awesome to be able to pet a lion without losing an arm, you know? That'd be kind of awesome, wouldn't it? Well, the Bible says that in heaven... In eternity, the things are going to be different. Maybe there's not going to be any animal predation at all. Uh, But we are going to live in harmony with nature. Now think about this. When you're able to live in harmony with something, with the beauty of God's creation, can you imagine what that's going to be like? Not having any fear of a shark attack. You can go swim on the beach all you want and not worry about sharks or jellyfish Anybody afraid of sharks? Uh, you know, some of you, okay. Um, I'm not really afraid of sharks because I determined a long time ago I ain't going where they are, all right? Now, in spite of Sharknado movies that like, you know, tornadoes pick the sharks up and put them in downtown Los Angeles, that ain't happening. I ain't gonna get eaten by a shark because I ain't going where they are. That's all I'm saying because I'm a wise man, all right? That's what I'm saying. So are you worried about getting eaten by a bear? No, no. Uh, They don't have bears in Kroger. Okay, that's all I'm saying. You don't have to dodge bears in the aisles of Walmart. That's all I'm saying. I ain't going where the bears are. You know what I mean? But my point is this. Heaven is going to be incredible. It's a blessed place. It says, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den they shall not hurt or destroy and all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord then Isaiah 25 uh, on this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food this is what the food's going to be like in heaven a feast of well aged wine now, for those of you that are Baptists, you grew up Baptist, you just take your pen and mark that word out, and you just put well-aged grape juice, okay? So, because uh, you think that there is not going to be any wine in heaven, and uh, that's okay, I'll drink yours for you, okay? So, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. In other words, it ain't going to be no junk. It's going to be good. It's going to be amazing. You know, I got to be honest with you. Um, I've tasted wine that's like $400 a bottle. Now, I, don't worry, I'm not, I don't buy that, okay? I, don't, I, don't, I can't afford that. But I have some rich friends that can. And uh, they gave me some wine that was like $400 a bottle. And I gotta be honest with you, I could get used to that, all right? I'm just saying, it was amazing, all right? Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say it's better than the $2 wine that you buy at the the convenience store, okay? 
Because it is amazing. And you know what God's showing us here? There is nothing about heaven that's not going to be blessed. There is nothing about heaven that's not going to be absolutely amazing. And it says, uh, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe tears from all faces. He's going to wipe every tear away. There's not going to be any more sorrow in heaven. Philippians 3.21, and he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. Remember Jesus' resurrected body? That it could, like, evidently could move at the speed of thought. You say, what do you mean? Well, the ascension, remember? And we do know that wherever heaven is, it seems to indicate that it's in the north, it's up, okay? And uh, that the nearest star is, what, millions of light years away, Okay? So he evidently didn't move at the speed of light, but the speed of thought. He literally appeared in rooms through walls where the doors were shut. So there's no limitation to this body. And yet it's a body that you could feel and touch and it could talk and it could eat. It's gonna be pretty amazing. And uh, he says, you're gonna have a body like Christ using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. You know what it's going to be like in heaven? You're going to have an amazing body. You don't have to go on a diet anymore. You're not going to have aches and pains anymore. You're, you're not going to get COVID-19 anymore. You're not going to get a cold anymore. You're not going to feel tired anymore. You're going to be able to, you know, if somebody says, hey, let's go run a marathon real quick, you'll be able to do it. I don't know how fast, but you're going to be able to do it. You say, why would I want to run a marathon? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there just in case. I'm simply saying there's not going to be any physical limitations. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think heaven's going to be a place where everybody's going to be like Superman and bounding over buildings in a single bound. I don't think that's the purpose of a resurrected, glorified body. But the point is this. You're going to have a relationship with Jesus. You're not going to be constrained by time and space anymore. I'm not suggesting that uh, there is, I mean, eternity is going to be different. That's what Psalm's saying. And so you're going to be under the control of the resurrection power of Jesus. That's what's so amazing about it. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5, And then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, brightest crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. I've often wondered what that's going to be like. I don't know if you've ever been to a place where they grew really naturally grown, tree ripened fruit. You go to North Georgia best apples you're ever going to taste in your life are those apples that are grown naturally there. And this time of year, I love the apples from North Georgia. If you've ever been down to uh, the more subtropical places that grow oranges or uh, grapefruit, I was in Cuba one time and um, they had this, all this tree ripened fruit and the grapefruits there were sweeter than oranges that you buy in the stores here. And I like the taste of grapefruit. I just don't like the bitterness of grapefruit. But the real tree ripened stuff, uh, you, you taste that grapefruit that's naturally ripened the way God intended for it to be. And it is amazing. It is so good. It, it, just, it, it just like, if you rubbed it on your forehead, your tongue would beat your brains out trying to get to it. You know what I'm saying? I've been places in the world where I've eaten the natural fruit that was grown the way it's supposed to be grown. Pineapple, my wife and I have been in Hawaii and we have eaten real fresh pineapple off a of pineapple grove or whatever you call it, pineapple farm. I've eaten oranges and, and citrus fruit from the Caribbean, uh, that places that are just like amazing that the fruit is so good. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you think this fruit's gonna be like? It doesn't have just one. It's got 12. 
just amazing to me what heaven is really going to be like. And the leaves of this tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will, will there be anything accursed. And this is the beauty of heaven. Nothing is going to be accursed. Nothing is going to be under the curse of sin. Everything is going to be the way God intended for it to be originally. Isn't that amazing? Um, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face. If you ever wonder about what it's going to be like when you're in heaven, you're going to be able to see the face of Jesus, which I believe you can read from this that it's not going to be like, well, you know, there's billions of people waiting to see him. i got to get in line. It's going to take half of eternity before I get up to actually shake his hand. No, no, that's not what this indicates. This indicates that at any moment, at any time, you'll be able to see Jesus. You'll be able to touch him. You'll be able to hug him. You'll be able to thank him. You'll be able to worship him. You'll be able to talk with him. Isn't that amazing? And, And the fact is, God is doing this for you and for me. And his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. So you don't have to worry about the nighttime because there's not going to be any more night. It'll be one eternal day. And so, you know, hey, you want to go doing so-and-so? Yeah, let's, let's do it later on today. Hey, you know, I was thinking about maybe doing what we had talked about Oh, yeah, we can do that today. One eternal day. You will not be constrained by time like we are here. And night will be no more, and they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Let me just say that in heaven, the curse is reversed. You live in natural harmony with nature. The demonic order is crushed. The the death that has invaded earth since the fall of mankind is defeated. And everyone worships God. You're going to have a perfect resurrected body. God will be with us at all times. You'll be able to worship him and communicate with him. And like in the Garden of Eden, walk with him. Isn't that amazing? I mean, just like there's no other thing in the world to worry about. Just taking a walk. Just taking a walk with God. You can ask him any question. You got questions? I got a lot of questions. I, I want to know why some things have happened, why others didn't. I've got questions that maybe, I don't know, a normal person may not have. I'm going to ask God, why are giraffes' necks so long? Isn't that weird? Why did you make octopus the way that they are, or octopi the way they are? That's weird. Um, You know, uh, why did you make Georgia fans so, so obstinate and hard to get along with, you know? I mean, come on, Lord, why why did you do that, right? Well, there are questions, and you're going to be able to ask him. It's a place of unimaginable joy and happiness. It's a beautiful place and a perfect place. It is a place of perfect relationships. Isn't it going to be amazing that in our relationships in heaven, you're going to get all the good and none of the bad. All the good, none of the bad. It's a place of perfect worship, and it's a place of eternal light. And here's the last thing. It's a real place. It's a blessed place. And it is a prepared place. It is prepared for the prepared. In other words, heaven's not for everybody, in spite of what you may feel. Heaven is prepared for those who are prepared. Listen to what Jesus said himself in John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You are trusting God. Now trust in me. There are many homes up where my father it lives, and I'm going to prepare them for your coming. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when everything is ready, then I will come and get you so that you can always be with me where I am. Now, I don't want to blow your mind, 
But when you read in Genesis, it took God six days. However long those days were, I'm not sure. But it took God six days to prepare this creation. Incredible. I mean, this, this world has got some incredible things to look at. Incredible things to experience. Six days. If it took him six days to make this universe, put all the stars in place, what is he going to make for us? And he's been gone over 2,000 years. You know what he said? He said, when it's ready, well, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when it gets ready, I'm going to come get you. When it's ready, I'm coming to get you. Get ready. Because as soon as your place is ready, I'm coming to get you. And the beauty of it is this. God will live with us forever. Well, here's the question I have for you. Are you prepared? Because here's the good news. Heaven is prepared for the prepared. You say, well, how do I get prepared? It is by exactly what he said in John chapter 14. You trust in God, trust in me. You want to be prepared? Trust in Jesus. You want to be ready? Don't trust in your goodness. Don't trust in your works. Trust in him. And that is the way that we get ready. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us all to be prepared. Help us all to be ready. And Lord, for those that are not ready, I hope that today is the day that they get ready. Now, before we finish the prayer, I wonder if you'd say, I'd like to be ready, Pastor. Well, you can receive Jesus today. You can trust him today. Say something like this. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Change me. Be mine. Be my Savior. If you say something like that to God, he promises to hear and answer your prayer. And so I want to challenge you today. If you're in the room, fill out that next step card. Drop it in one of the buckets on the way out. If you're online, go to the bottom of the page and click and fill out that card and indicate that you received Christ today. And we'll follow up with you. But what is God saying to you today? Maybe for some in the room, God brought someone to your mind that needs Jesus. Maybe you can invite them this week. For others, maybe it was that God brought to your mind that you needed to be ready. Or maybe there was something in your life that you need to change. Whatever the Holy Spirit began to talk to you about, I hope you'll respond to that. But then let's end with this verse. Look right this way. Revelation uh, 22, verse 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. That's Jesus. He said, I'm going to come soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. So Jesus said, I'm coming soon. And in the meantime, God's grace is going to be with you. Well, that's good news, isn't it? Well, once again, if you're new here to this church, please fill out the Next Step card and uh, drop it in the, one of the buckets on the way out. We had our Next Step class today. Had some people go through that class. It was exciting. And if you've not been through it, then uh, next month we'll do it again and you can go through that class if you'd like. We had some people talk about getting baptized today. And if you want to be baptized at our next baptism, sign up on that Next Step class. All right? So it's very, very important. And thank you for being a part of our services today. Now, don't forget, tomorrow we've got Trunk or Treat. And once again, this is an outreach opportunity for us. And um, it's going to be really exciting. And I'm very, very looking forward to all the people that are going to come through. And we're going to be able to invite to Stillwater's Church. I'm excited about it. Okay? All right. I love you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for joining us online as well. You are dismissed. 
We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.